A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with a sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. The Word of the Lord. So a few weeks ago, my family took a 14-hour road trip out to the Black Hills of South Dakota. And if that sounds fun to you, I should probably mention that we have a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a one-year-old. So make of that what you will. No, actually, it was a really great time as a family. Our kids were champs, even though we stretched them a little bit. At the recommendation of a friend, we dragged them to the lighting ceremony at Mount Rushmore, which starts at 9 p.m. I promise we're good parents. But, and, and they engaged it to varying levels. Um, but th- this lighting ceremony has a whole program. It's an hour long. And they have this video that talks about the story of Mount Rushmore. And it highlights the accomplishments of the presidents depicted on this, the side of this huge mountain. And it focuses on how each of these presidents contributed to the America that we live in today. And if you've ever been there, you know that it's a rather patriotic event. Towards the end, everybody stands up and sings America the Beautiful, and there's a flag-lowering ceremony, and they invite veterans to come up and uh, and, and be honored as part of this. It's really an impressive uh, program. Well, the next day, we got up earlier than any of us wanted uh, to go to a, a, a state park nearby, and on the way, we stopped at another monument. This one is the Crazy Horse Memorial. And th- this memorial is, it's 10 times larger than Rushmore, which I didn't realize, and it's not finished yet. It depicts the uh, Lakota chieftain, Crazy Horse, who's best known for uh, his efforts uh, resisting the U.S. government in, in seizing Lakota territory that, that had been promised to them. And this video is a little bit different. Uh, it, it tells a story of struggle. It tells a story of, of loss and of the determination of this Polish sculptor named, I'm going to get his name wrong, Korzak Zukowski, to honor the vision of the Lakota chiefs chiefs who asked him to make this monument. And he he worked on it for his whole life. His whole family poured their lives into it, and he died before they even finished carving the face. And now they finished the face, and they've got part of a finger, and his family continues to work towards building this monument. Both Rushmore and Crazy Horse are memorials. But at their core... These memorials are not about the people who are depicted on the side of the mountain. What I realized after going through the programs of these different sites is that Mount Rushmore is a memorial to the American dream, to America. Crazy Horse is a memorial to the struggle of Native American peoples to retain their customs and their languages and their land. They both tell a story that goes beyond the faces that are there. Hebrews chapter 11 functions for us as a sort of memorial as well. It's made up of a list of people from Israel's past. You've been going through that list, but it's not really about the doubt. It's about faith in the promises of God and how God's people have responded in faith to those promises throughout history. Unfortunately, though, it can be really easy to look at that list in Hebrews 11 and get caught up in the names. It would be really easy to say, I'm no Abraham. I'm no Moses. 
I'm nobody. People like me don't have faith like that. That would be missing the point. Because the book of Hebrews wasn't written to enshrine these so-called heroes of faith. It's written for the people of God. And next week, Father Aaron is going to be preaching from Hebrews chapter 10. And the writer of Hebrews is going to call us to action. Often in the Bible, before God calls us to action, he calls us to remembrance. Before God calls us to action, he calls us to remembrance. And that's what Hebrews 11 has been for us. It's been a call to remembrance. The first 31 verses of Hebrews 11 go through the first six books of the Bible, picking out these stories of faith. And then the writer gets to verse 32. And I think of this section as like the et cetera part of the chapter. He's like, yeah, what more can I say? I'm going to run out of time. There's there's no more space on the scroll. And he starts going through names like a, it's like a video montage flashback. You've got Gideon and Barak and Samson, and Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets. And then you get a series of scenes with no names at all. But it's all designed to refresh our memories. And as we wrap up this chapter, I want to pull out three themes, three threads of of things that we are being called to remember as we wrap up Hebrews chapter 11. We're called to remember the faithful deeds of our spiritual forebears. We're called to remember how they suffered. And we're called to remember what we've been given in Jesus Christ. So the first item is a sort of review. We're called to remember the faithful deeds of our forebears. Now, I want to point something out. When you look at all the people mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, there's not like a faithful type. The only thing they really have in common with each other, if you looked at all the different names, is that they're all part of the story of God's people. They include farmers and sojourners, migrants, prostitutes, kings, prophets. They didn't even make it on the list because they were particularly godly. Look at some of the names we read today. This is where we got into the judges. And so we've got Gideon, who usually in Sunday school, they focus on the middle part of Gideon's career, where he's like doing great things and following the Lord. He starts off as a coward. And then towards the end of his life, he becomes an idolater. Then you've got Barak, who refuses to do what God tells him unless Deborah comes with him. Shouldn't Deborah be on the list? Or for that matter, Jael, right? She's the one who really hits the nail on the head, so to speak. Then there's Samson, all-around bad dude. He is a womanizer. He's a hothead. Even when he does something that's, like, good for the people of God, when he, like, defeats their enemies, it's because he's mad at somebody. He's getting revenge. You've got Jephthah. I won't go into his story, but he makes a really tragic decision and carries through on it. David and Samuel maybe make a little more sense, but they're flawed too. If you go back and read these stories, normal, weak, sinful, sometimes insecure, people who nonetheless are given the gift of faith when they need it. In each case, they're remembered for a specific moment of faith. It's not that they're naturally faithful. In fact, in almost all of these cases, we're told that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them. And then they're able to trust Him enough to do all of these incredible things. God's people have always been a scrappy band of misfits. And we shouldn't stand a chance. But time and again, God gives us the faith to do the kinds of impossible things listed here. They conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead from resurrection. You might recognize some of these events. We're not even told the names of the people because that's not the important thing here. But people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were the widow of Zarephath. Others could refer to any number of Old Testament people. The point is, these were normal people like us who were given the gift of faith. So why does this matter? Why do we need to remember the faith of these ordinary people? It matters because God still calls ordinary people like you and like me to acts of faith today. We need to remember where we came from. Do you think 
perhaps that God couldn't possibly use you to bring your coworker one step closer to faith in Jesus? Remember how you came? Do you think that, that you'll never be able to, to raise the, the money for that mission that God has set on your heart or, I don't know, to find a spiritual beacon to home? Do you think that seems impossible? Remember who you came from. Do you think that you could never plan an event welcoming hundreds of migrants into your community? You're doing it because you remember where you came from. Sometimes we don't want to take that risky step of faith because we don't think that we have what it takes. We're afraid that, that we're not strong enough or we're not smart enough or we're not rich enough to do what God calls us to do. And you know what? You're probably not. But God is. And what we find time and again in the story of God's people is that when God calls us to an act of faith, he gives us what we need to do it. So we need to remember the ordinary, broken, messy people who came before us so that we can have confidence that when God calls us to an act of faith, he'll give us the strength to do what he called us to do. But of course, not all the stories here are stories of spectacular victims. We also need to remember what our faith forebearers suffered. Look at the second half of verse 35 with me. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains or imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Here the writer of Hebrews is talking about the prophets who suffered because of their faith because they were carrying out the message that God had given them to bring to God's people. Some of these events aren't in the Bible. Some of them were passed down by Jewish tradition. For instance, the bit about being sawn in two probably refers to Isaiah, who is believed to have been killed by King Manasseh. Others can apply to any number of prophets in the Bible. But it raises a question for us. Because if faith is a way to please God, why did these people suffer? Or in some cases even die for their faith? Didn't we just say that if God calls us to something, he'll give us the strength to do it? Does this contradict that? No. Because sometimes what God calls us to actually involves suffering. And the strength that we need is the strength to suffer well. Have you ever heard the term prosperity theology, prosperity gospel? It's an umbrella term for a kind of teaching that says that if we have faith in God, we will always experience victory in this life. If we have enough faith, we will be financially prosperous and physically healthy. And if we find ourselves suffering, maybe it's because we don't have enough faith. Maybe we haven't believed quite enough. Maybe if we just hang on long enough, God will turn it all around and we'll recover and we'll get that job and things will look rosy and our ship will come in. It's a nice thought. But it's not biblical. Yes, our God is a provider. We believe that. And yes, our God can and often does give his people victory over their circumstances in the here and now. But to say that this is always how God operates isn't biblical. Nor does it make much sense of our experience, does it? Sometimes the great act of faith that we are called to is to faithfully go through suffering even unjust suffering. As Christians, we're able to do this because we believe that God's promises aren't just for this life. We believe in the resurrection of body and the life everlasting. And we believe that our suffering can actually be redemptive if we suffer faithfully. This kind of faithful suffering is actually part of what helped Christianity become the worldwide phenomenon that it is. Between the first and fourth centuries of the church, Christians faced being arrested and even killed for refusing to worship the Roman emperor, or in some cases, just for being part of a suspicious religious group that nobody really understood. And during their trial, they were typically given a chance to recant. They they actually had an out most of the time. Now, if the Christian faith were just a way to have a more prosperous life, it would make sense for them to recant. Or maybe 
to pay lip service to the emperor, but then deep down really believe in Jesus. But that's not what they do. Because as Christians, they believe that those who trust in Jesus will be raised again to new life. And so even if they died, suffering would bear fruit and rewards in the next life. The early Christians believed that if they died proclaiming the name of Jesus, they would enter into the presence of the Lord and would be commended by their, for their faith in the face of suffering, just as the prophets before them were. They remember the words of Jesus when he said, blessed are you when others persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. What happened was when the people of the Roman Empire saw how these Christians, even Christian leaders, faced their death, they said, this is the real deal. These people really believe in Jesus, and they began to believe. It became such a phenomenon that an early Christian writer named Tertullian made the famous observation that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The more Rome tried to persecute them, the more the church flourished. Now, I hesitate to talk about persecution in 21st century America. Uh, Because let's be honest, we don't face anything like what our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world experience. I have a friend who who works in China, and she told me about uh, going to a church service where an American guest preacher was, was telling the local congregation to pray for the persecuted church in America because uh, we were maybe in danger of losing tax exempt status. And the, just the way that felt to her of these folks can't gather legally without an official sanction from, from the government. We might lose privilege or be disliked or ostracized. We are not the same. So I haven't seen that kind of persecution in America. What I have seen quite a bit of in America is fear of persecution. I, I, I've seen that a lot in, in the conversations that I have with folks that down the road, it, it, it's, it's going to happen. And I'm a prophet. I can't say if it will, if it won't, when it might happen. But I want to speak for a moment about what we do with that fear. Because there, there are two temptations. On one side, there's a temptation to avoid the potential for suffering by accommodating to a dominant culture. Uh, but whatever it is that's happening in our culture, whatever is offensive about what we believe, setting it aside so that we don't bother people. Uh, my, my parents um, were, they spent time working in the Middle East for a long time. And uh, their first year in, in this country, I, I visited them. And I, there was a, it was around Christmas, New Year time. They, they were having a party at the church. And as we walked in the doors, we saw police, a police car just like right outside the door. And my dad was a little concerned. And so he asked one of the church leaders, what was going on and if we needed to be worried. And he said, oh no, they're just there to make sure nobody bothers. We thought this is great. Oh, that, that's amazing. And the reason was this predominantly Muslim country highly valued security and stability. And they don't want anything to happen that will jeopardize that, that stability. And so they protect the rights of Christians who are about a 4% minority to worship and practice their faith. So long as they don't cause trouble by telling their Muslim neighbors about Jesus. So the result is that it's actually been difficult to mobilize some of the culturally Christian communities there, the the churches there, to share Jesus with anyone outside of their cultural Christian community. My father told me about a young man who came to Christ and he had to go to a few different churches to find a church that would baptize him because they didn't want to cause trouble. They wanted to stay in their lane. They didn't want to challenge the laws of the government for fear of what would happen. And, and that, that, that can be a real temptation that if we challenge somebody's worldview, well, we won't get arrested, but we might get destroyed on social media, right? It's, it's tempting to accommodate our faith to a dominant culture. But unlike in the Middle East, we've got a different situation. See, we're not the same level of minority here. We've got a critical mass, which means we have another temptation. It can be tempting for us to avoid suffering by gaining so much political power that nobody can touch us. I'm not going to get into politics. This is not my pulpit. This is a conversation that you guys can have. But it's complicated. It's truly complicated because we live in a democracy. And it's our civil duty to to shape the laws of, of our government. And as Christians, we are going to engage that in ways that reflect the laws of God. That's good. That's true. That's beautiful. 
But as Christians, our political engagement always needs to come from a place of faith, not of fear. We start getting into trouble when we start approaching our politics from a position of fear. And this happens on both sides of the aisle, by the way. When we come from a position of fear, we start saying and doing things that actually end up being antithetical to our faith because our faith is not based. It's based on conviction and the promises of God. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm thankful to live in a country where I can worship and practice my faith freely. I pray that we will always have that freedom. But even if that were to change someday, God forbid, it would still be a good day for the gospel of Jesus. I know that Emmanuel Anglican would still be here, if not in this building, lifting high the Son of God in the city of Chicago. I know that. I'm not saying that we should seek suffering. I'm not saying that we shouldn't ask God to deliver us from suffering. It's good to pray for the deliverance of the persecuted church. When Jesus faced suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if there's any way for this cup of suffering to pass, let it. And then he said, Not my will, but yours be done. Sometimes it's God's good will to deliver us from suffering. But sometimes the way he shows his mercy to us is to be with us in our suffering. Sometimes what we actually need from the Lord is the strength to suffer with faith. And suffering for our faith doesn't just come from persecution, does it? The young woman who, because of her faith conviction, carries her baby to term, even though her finances are shaky and she's not sure what's going to happen, she's suffering. Faith. The young single or celibate man who abstains from pursuing his physical desires outside of marriage, even though everyone around him tells him to go for it. He might suffer because of his faith. Or the family that's really too big for their house. They're outgrowing their space, but they, they, they know that if they move, they wouldn't be able to give as much to the poor in their community or to their church or to, to overseas workers. They're suffering faithfully. Throughout the Bible, we see a God who honors those who suffer faithfully. And as Christians, if and when we experience suffering, especially if it's because of our faith, we know that it's not because God has abandoned. In fact, if we let it, suffering can strengthen our faith because it tells us that we are in the same family as those who have suffered faithfully before us as they wait for the promises of God. And if we do suffer, we have something to sustain us that the Old Testament prophets didn't even have. This is the third thing we want to remember in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. What is this something better? That we have, but they didn't. Spoiler alert for chapter 12, it's Jesus. All of these men and women mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 were sojourning and struggling and suffering in hopes of seeing God's promises fulfilled. And they only experienced a partial fulfillment. Abraham was trusting God to give him a permanent home. He was a, a, a migrant wanderer. The only bit of land he owned in his lifetime was a burial plot for his wife. Moses. Actually, before, there, there was an ultimate fulfillment there. Because now we see that with the coming of Jesus, we who are the children of Abraham are brought into God's forever kingdom. We are given a permanent home. Moses brought God's people out of slavery in Egypt. But only Jesus brought them out of slavery to sin and death. God promised David that one of his descendants would always be on the throne of Israel. And then that kingdom fell apart. But God has given us a forever king through the descendant of David, Jesus. Of an eternal kingdom. The Old Testament prophets suffered and died without ever seeing how God's promise to be a shepherd for his people would be fulfilled by the good shepherd. The men and women on this list have worked and risked and sacrificed and suffered to see the very hope that you and I have. And that should produce something in us. It's a bit like, have any of you, were, were any of you ever the first person in your family to go to college? Anybody in that boat here? A few of you? I think for some people, college just seems like the thing that you do, right? Like after high school, you go to college. 
but especially for immigrant communities or maybe poorer communities, rural communities, to send someone to college represents decades of sacrifice and suffering and hard work. And so a first-generation college student doesn't have the luxury of blowing off a class for no good reason or, or not applying themselves to homework because they recognize the opportunity as the gift that it is. They, they treasure that gift because they know that they're not just carrying their own dreams into their college experience. They're carrying the dreams of a community. Parents and grandparents who worked and struggled in the hopes that their children and their children's children would have a better life than they did. That's what the prophets did for us. They carried God's message for us to the point of suffering and death so that when the Messiah came, we would recognize him for who he is. I wish I always carried this feeling of a first-generation college student with me. To be completely honest, I don't. There are times when the Christian life feels like a chore to me. Maybe it does to you as well sometimes. And I feel sometimes that life would be so much easier if I could just live my life, my way, if I could use my time, my money, my body as if it were my own. And when I don't feel that way, or sorry, when I feel that way about, about my Christian faith, I've noticed that it's often when I stop, I take my eye off of what I've really been given. When I stop treasuring what this is that God has given me in Jesus Christ, I haven't just received a tradition or a culture or a beautiful aesthetic of worship. Each of us who have trusted in Jesus has received a new life, a new heart, the Holy Spirit of God, membership in the family of God, a forever home under a king who will never abuse his power, who will always fight for us and care for us and love us as his children. This is such a gift that we've been given. Now, it's true that we haven't arrived yet, There's a sense in which we're in the same boat as all those men and women who came before us. It said that they would be perfected with us, right? Because we're still waiting to see this beautiful vision perfected. We're waiting for the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world to be the same, for evil and suffering and death to be destroyed. But with the coming of Jesus, we see the beginning of the end. It's like our spiritual ancestors were running in the world's longest relay race and they've passed the baton to us. I don't want to get too far into next week's sermon, but it's as if the writers of, he- of Hebrews are saying to us, do you see how close you are? You've been dropped into the last leg of the race. Don't give up. Hang on to Jesus. Don't give up hope. Don't disengage. There are so many distractions around us calling us to disengage. Remember what God's people have gone through to get to what you have right now and treasure the gift of Jesus that you have been given. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.